I want to maybe talk about the Sacramento Valley today and sort of what's going on from an economic standpoint. The Sacramento Business Review just released a forecast of the Sacramento Valley. Uh, and there's some intriguing aspects of that we're going to talk about, especially from a credit union and a member standpoint. And in the middle, I'll provide you with a macro overview, which also talks to a certain extent of what Sacramento Business Review did, but then also digs one layer deeper in terms of thinking about, okay, where's the economy going uh, from a couple other different angles that the uh, forecast didn't quite talk as much about. Uh, and then we're going to see where we go from there. So the first question I want to ask our panelists today are, or is, what do you think is the number one thing or most important aspect of the Sacramento economy that members should be thinking about in 2023? Yeah, and I'll, and I'll answer just kind of what we're seeing from our, our membership perspective is, is just the ability for our members to manage their finances is becoming tougher and tougher. Um, there was an article, I think, that came out later in 2022 that said the average auto payment just cleared $700 a month for the first time. Um, inflationary factors are real things for our members going to the grocery store, paying their monthly bills. So I think just the everyday living it's just getting harder and harder for our members, especially in Sacramento and, and San Joaquin Valley, just to continue to manage their finances, grow their kind of internal net worth. So I would say that's the biggest thing that we're seeing with our members and having those crucial conversations with them of, is how to better manage their finances, given the inflationary factors and just the rising costs of all goods um, for Sacramentoans in 2023. Yeah, I would I would have to uh, agree. In general, it's really an affordability issue, and uh, you know, decisions that have been made in the past are now impacting budgets today. It's hard to get rid of a rent or a mortgage payment that you agreed to or signed a lease on a while ago, um, and the car that you bought that maybe was affordable when groceries and gas and utilities weren't as expensive as they are today. So members are having to make some tough choices, and I think are. A, in a real situation where they uh, appreciate the financial education that, that we and credit unions offer. And I think that's the one thing about the credit union difference is the fact that it's member and education first with the idea of shaping long-term financial outcomes rather than short-term product push, which of course is the great attraction of this industry. Uh, one of the things you said that I wanted to talk about real quick, that something we will talk about in a little bit is on deposits. So one of the things I just came back from Washington, D.C. last week at the uh, GAC meetings, and one of the biggest aspects economically is what's been going on with deposits and how credit unions are making choices around that. And it fits exactly that narrative that you're seeing members having to make marginal choices as inflation maybe has drained their deposits and pushed them closer to the edge. Are you seeing that generally among membership that deposits are going down on average in such a way that you, you know that there's certain members who maybe have a car loan with your credit union, or you have had trouble in the past that you all are kind of monitoring a little bit more closely? Yeah, we, we definitely, I would say we have segments and we monitor deposit with very, very closely, right? That That's why we're here as a credit union. We take in deposits and lend that money to our communities. Um, that's the whole point of why credit unions were chartered. Um, so we definitely pay close attention to interest rates, especially on our deposits and obviously our loans. But in 2022, rates increase at the fastest pace ever in the last 40 years. So it has definitely been very, very active um, in our asset liability commi committee meetings, monitoring both deposit rates as well as loan rates and making sure we're doing the right thing for our member. But yeah, it, it is definitely a very competitive um, landscape right now, especially on the deposit side of the house. Yeah, I think one thing to remember too is, uh, or to point out is that, you know, when rates rise, it's certainly a challenge on the lending side and carrying debt for members is challenging as rates go up, but a rising rate environment is great for the depositors. And so for our members who do have those depository accounts, we want to um, support and reward them uh, to the greatest extent we can by offering really competitive and attractive deposit rates. And I think as a, as a credit union environment that we're very focused on providing whatever value we can to our members. And a few years ago, that was really low interest rates on loans. And in today's environment, it's pretty aggressive rates on savings. Totally, and, and to a certain extent, it's been intriguing to watch the transition that took place over the last three years in terms of the financial, uh, financial aspect of credit unions. This is also true in banking. I'm a board member of a credit union in Northern California, just above the Golden Gate Bridge and Credit Union. 
and just watching the roller coaster in terms of the big surge, then the drain, then the big surge, and now the big drain, you, you know that some members have got to be close to the edge as a result of that, and it's something we also have been watching very closely. Folks, before we need, or dive more deeply into this uh, Sacramento Business Review forecast, I'm going to provide a quick macro overview. So uh, my everyday business is as a macro economist, and what I want to do real quick is provide a brief look at the forecast from a, from a couple different angles uh, that kind of supplement what we saw in the Sacramento Business Review. The first one is looking at the macro economy over the next few years. So the Philadelphia Federal Reserve every quarter surveys 40 forecasters. It's almost like the blue chip forecast, and they ask about a bunch of different data, but I pull out three pieces that tend to be most germane, not only to credit union thinking, but also just sort of generally the movement of the economy as far as how macro economists might see it. And so I'm gonna look at gross domestic product or income after inflation, that's why we call it real. I'm gonna look at the unemployment rate as a measure of the labor market, but I'll talk a little bit about the caveats around that in just a second. And then something that's kind of a mouthful about inflation, which is called core personal consumption expenditures prices or core PCE. And that percentage change is how the Federal Reserve thinks about inflation when they think about whether or not they're going to change policy. So these data are just from a few weeks ago, and the data for GDP have actually gone up for 2023. So as we were moving toward the end of 2022, the forecast into 2023, we're getting a little bit more pessimistic. And you can see the column next to that shaded column that's titled new was last quarter's forecast. And in that quarter, 2023 was seen as only going up about seven tenths of 1% for the entire year. And usually in years when that's happened, there's, there's the threat of having a more likely recession because the closer you get growth in an, in an entire year down to zero growth from the previous year, the more likely that any little event, any little geopolitical issue or something you did not expect to have happen in the macro economy could push you down toward negative change. But it's not only negative change that leads to a declaration of recession, it has to, there's a bunch of different items. And that's why we're showing all three of these, because generally speaking, when we have a declaration of recession, all three of these items, plus uh, a couple of measures of productivity, things like industrial production, have to be all going in the opposite direction of growth at the same time. But this is good. This is better than it was, even though 2024 is down a little bit. It's not down that much. And in, in a sense, there's a more optimistic look at the economy by these forecasters. And in fact, uh, the probability of recession among these 40 forecasters has actually gone below 50% for 2023 now as a result of changes in data and the things that they're looking at. The unemployment rate is kind of part of that in the sense the labor market is still very robust and there's not much forecasted change in the unemployment rate, but there's a couple caveats in that. Remember, unemployment, as we, as we measure it, does not count people who are close to the edge of their jobs, meaning that they're kind of marginally employed, somewhat part-time, that's another measure of unemployment. So the one, this is the headline unemployment. And in fact, it is the uh, job losses of folks who have been out of work for 16 weeks or more than the Federal Reserve thinks about as their key data point, because over the last 12 recessions, 11 of them have been preceded by an uptick in that number, the number of people who have been out of work for 16 weeks or more. And that number has actually slipped up a little bit. And that's what has given the Federal Reserve a little bit of pause about, about not increasing interest rates anymore because they're concerned that, that, uh, that the recession piece is starting to, to kick in a little bit and to a certain extent that's what slowed down the pace of interest rate changes. But the next stop, which is inflation, this is the latest forecast, but it's been really tough to take that number and push it down any further. So one of the concerns for policymakers is, is we don't want to stop the interest rate pressure if we think that a lot of the inflation is demand driven, but if we put too much pressure on interest rates to go up, we start to see people lose their jobs and then we see longer durations of unemployment back to that other measure of unemployment. And we haven't seen this, these price data go down with real velocity yet. But the supposition is will be about 3% inflation by the end of this year and then kind of down to pre-pandemic norms closer to the middle of this decade, but it's gonna take that much longer. So we gotta watch for that. The good thing is, is that if you actually look back eight quarters, we've grown eight quarters in a row. We do a little math trick as economists. We look one quarter back and multiply that percentage change by four. And then we call that the change in GDP. And that's kind of what you see in that shaded area. If you actually look 12 months ago at the estimated level of income growth after you take inflation away, you get, we had growth eight quarters in a row. It's another reason we have not had a declared recession yet, even though the last, the first two quarters of 2022 saw negative growth. If you look at the Sacramento metro area, these data are the latest data in terms of the industrial breakdown of job growth, starting with the starting with January 2020. So each one of these columns is a percentage change by certain months between April 2020 and December 2022, looking at the evolution 
of Sacramento's labor market. So April and May, devastating months in terms of job loss. We all know that story. By the end of December 2020, however, Sacramento had actually seen some pickup. So you can see if you're moving left to right, construction is a little gray column that's above the red dotted line, which is our benchmark. We want all these columns to be above that red dotted line in the end. Retail, retail had actually come back. Sacramentans had actually gone back out and started patronizing their uh, brick and mortar businesses. Transportation and warehousing, primarily what we're seeing in terms of home delivery, that's absolutely picked up and that's true across uh, basically every county in California and most in the United States. But you can see those to the right of transportation warehousing utilities had not quite come back by the end of 2020. By the end of 2021, we hadn't really seen much change either. But by the end of 2022, we had seen some change. So Sacramento is one of those places in California because of its size has really bucked the trend for most urban areas. So if you move sort of north to south, Sacramento, San Francisco, San Jose, Fresno, LA, San Diego, those as the major metro areas of California, Sacramento has really been the star of those metro areas that sort of coming out of the pandemic, let's say the most robustly. Fresno is pretty close. Fresno was doing very, very well through the end of 2021 and the middle of 2022, and it's kind of flattened out a little bit. And that's due to kind of their growth and then ultimately the infrastructure around Fresno, I'm sorry, to grow at a more rapid pace. But these are good data, even though you still see some negative numbers, that growth from the bottom and then ultimately those positive numbers, that's really good stuff. And Sacramento has really been a lead for the state coming out of the pandemic. We kind of alluded to this idea. You can really, in some ways, encapsulate the evolution of deposits by looking at this graph. This is the personal savings rate. What that means is what is the percentage of the next dollar of income earned by someone in the United States on average as in terms of the percent of that dollar that they save? And that savings went way up in 2020. You can see that shaded really shaded skinny area or very skinny shaded area, sorry, that in 2020, real spike. That's when all those federal payments came home. And a lot of people saved that initially, and then they started to spend it and drain that savings. And then up again, when the next federal tranche came out and then have been sort of bleeding that savings down ever since. And then right now we're kind of right back where we were sometime in the early 2010s. These months, these data are monthly from January, 2007 forward. So at that 4.7% rate, some of the questions that we're asking is, hey, are we going to see a deposit rate on, meaning that rates, I'm sorry, that we have this downturn in savings rates. Our credit unions and banks now going to start competing more completely with each other for member and customer deposits. The answer is we know that's going to happen. The trick is how many credit unions are actually exposed to the risk of not of managing or have been managing their deposits against their loan portfolio well, where it's going to have to slow down their lending, or they're going to have to look at the Federal Home Loan Bank as sort of the next source of funds to kind of keep the lending machine on the move. We know delinquencies are rising, but the beauty of it is, is that we attacked the problem very quickly in 2020 and delinquencies are rising, but not rising in earnest in terms of percentage of assets, which, uh, sorry, of assets, which is great. What's been weird is that we've actually seen some inelasticity in terms of housing demand. So while housing loans have slowed down in demand, they haven't slowed down as precipitously as we thought they would in terms of the increase in interest rates. So it kind of makes you wonder how many people are using cash as part of the deal, and they're not as they're not as responsive to increasing interest rates or not. This is something we might talk about in a minute. And should we have seen all this happening, given we have this sort of you know manna from heaven as a result of the pandemic and the fiscal and monetary policy decisions that were made in 2021, basically through the beginning of 2022? Should that have been something we'd seen in terms of this wild roller coaster? And the answer is yes. And it's not as bad as not seeing what happened right before the Great Recession in terms of the housing market. But it's something we're going to watch and see how banks and credit unions kind of evolve through this, specifically how our members are affected by this wild race around deposits and whether or not lending will continue to move forward. This is the latest housing price forecast in Zillow, and it kind of is a, is, is a composite forecast of what we're seeing out there. Originally, housing economists were relatively pessimistic about what 2023 would look like, but the, that idea around inelasticity in terms of rates rising and whether or not people are really making uh, marginal decisions not to purchase a home because interest rates went up as fast as they did. These data are very, very mild in terms of after a really nice growth period in, in uh, housing prices, there's not a lot predicted for a downturn in housing prices yet. But I try to keep telling people that we should be expecting somewhere between 10, 15 percent reduction in prices before the cycle kind of bottoms out, simply because there's probably a few more interest rate hikes to happen. And if we're running around looking for deposits, as depository institutions, we have to imagine that that's going to make people think about whether or not they want to release cash, buy a home in a market where prices might be falling, or they want to sit on the sideline and see what happens to prices before they jump back in. 
And it'll be that education piece that credit unions do so well about where are you right now in your life about whether or not you should come in and buy a home. Well, part of the education process is thinking, one, what's the forecast look like? So as we're going to talk about in a minute, the Sacramento Business Review had a really robust forecast. Sacramento County's done well and navigated through this time very, very well. They've actually expanded their diversity in terms of the number of industries and businesses that are in Sacramento and are a lot less dependent on the political cycle in Sacramento than they were even 10 years ago. So this is good. And that lending piece is a big deal in terms of Sacramento's housing market staying in balance. Uh, we look forward, what we saw in the NAF, in the credit, uh, sorry, the consumer sentiment piece of the Sacramento Business Review forecast that state credit union sponsors is that it, Sacramento generally are a little bit more optimistic than the national look. And it's, it's something that might actually propel spending in Sacramento and kind of people to think that, you know, it's not as bad as it looks on the surface. And that's good. It keeps people from panicking. However, our smaller businesses are going to have some issues. And that's also alluded to in the business reviews forecast is that the increase in, in cost of doing business, including wages, are going to put more of a squeeze on our small businesses than our larger ones. There's a lot of macro headwinds with higher rates, geopolitical uncertainty, domestic uncertainty as we creep closer to our own presidential elections here, and just thinking about where inflation is going to ultimately land. Those are things that, as economists, we think about all the time is how does that balancing act happen between jobs and inflation? The league has an enormous amount of resources. So E-Train is something to check out with the league. Please see that. Uh, please contact Angela Daly, who's the manager of those educational programs. This is something the league puts out for members, for credit union staff. These are things that can really kind of keep you uh, on track in terms of what's going on in the industry. Please check that out. So folks, those are the way things I see out there. What I wanna ask our panelists as I kind of transition back to away from the slides and to our screen here is what's not in the forecast that members should be thinking about that live in the Sacramento area that would be good for them to know from your angle? I would say, I think you hit on a lot of the highlights, but I would say, I think on, on a positive note, I think Sacramento has a really bright future. And I think one of the articles that really just kind of brought it to my attention again was Forbes obviously named Sacramento one of the greatest places to live in California. So I think although there are definitely um, factors facing Sacramentans, uh, but I think we definitely have a bright future. And just when you look at overall factors that they included in the Forbes Best Place to Live, they obviously looked at median home price, personal income, unemployment, and crime rate. I think those are really, really things that really impact or in the face of our membership on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that was a, is a great um, article to really highlight the great opportunity we have as Sacramentans to live and earn a great wage and really, really have those great things and that great connection to our community. I agree, Allison. Uh, the, the quality of life in the Sacramento region continues to be very high and people are attracted to that. And even within the, the housing uh, sector, you know, that is top of mind for a lot of folks, uh, th there are plenty of people who really wanted to purchase a home when rates were low and the demand was so high and the inventory was so low. There were bidding wars, as we're all aware of, and it just became uh, a real defeating environment for them. And so I think, to your point, there are still folks out there that this is a good time to buy. And the great thing about credit unions is that we can meet with our members and really understand what their situation is and help to guide them making great financial decisions for themselves and understanding all of the dynamics and the opportunities. And maybe now is a great time for them and maybe it isn't. And I think that taking that consultative approach that credit unions take help people to recognize that. Yes, yeah, so the one thing about Sacramento too is that the area of Sacramento has gotten much more broad in terms of how the core Sacramento area affects a bunch of different places. I mean, in the last 20 years, Yolo County, even Yuba and Sutter to a certain extent, Placer, El Dorado, San Joaquin County, all of them kind of feed off the beast that Sacramento has become. Is there certain parts of Sacramento that y'all feel like is, is really a, a great example of the leap forward that's taken place in Sacramento? And is, are there other pockets of Sacramento that you think are still kind of have some challenges, but have some good opportunities as well? And I'll start. I think Tiffany at SAFE and us at Golden One have definitely invested in a lot in downtown is really being that nexus to Sacramento, to the future growth um, of the community. I've had the pleasure of living in Sacramento in the area most of my entire life. 
And I am so excited to see how much downtown Sacramento has re revitalized in the last 10 to 15 years, obviously with the addition of Wilda One Center, and then obviously this safe convention center. I think that's a great commitment and great um, focus on downtown Sacramento, because I really think that downtown area is our future um, and encourages more companies, more businesses. Um, and then I think the outlying regions around there will continue to prosper as well. Uh, but I think the, the biggest focus is, is on that downtown nexus. Absolutely. There is a lot going on there. And even if you look at the infrastructure work that's going on on the freeways to make it more accessible and easy for people to get into that downtown area, a huge, huge focus. I'll also point out that the, uh, the South of 50 project going on in Folsom, I don't know how you can ignore that, is not a representation that this is an, an area and a region that's continuing to grow and attract families. Um, attract people that want that high quality of life, which is also very exciting to see. And are you all seeing more working families becoming members? Because this is something that as economists, we watched what happened in 2020, where there was a lot of population shifting around California and from California to other parts of the United States. And one of our concerns was is that when sort of the dust settled, we would have a situation where a lot of working families left California and a lot of older workers and maybe those that weren't bringing their families with them but were bringing wealth with them would move into California as housing units became available and would sort of shift the labor force. Have you all seen more families come in as, as members or has, it, has the age profile of your membership kind of gradually gotten older in a way that might be something you're watching closely? Yeah, we consistently look at the demographic of our membership base, but I would say one of the most encouraging trends that we have seen in probably the last two to three years is the younger generation is the generation that's making up mo most of our new members, which I think is an exact, really, really exciting for our future. Um, so we're definitely really, really excited about that, making sure we have um, those right services, those right opportunities, those right products um, for that younger generation, but also never losing focus on the uh, uh, older generation as well. But it is, we are definitely seeing a, a lot of kind of younger family growth or younger new members coming to the credit union. We're seeing a similar demographic shift uh, and trying to meet those members where their needs are. Their need for uh, financial education is at a, in a different place than the older membership um, and, uh, and the way that they want that information delivered to them, how they want to communicate and interact with their uh, financial institution. And so we're trying to, to cater to those shifts. And on the member business side, is there anything that you're seeing that might be something that other credit unions that See this would want to know from what your own vantage point in Sacramento is it, has there been any shift there or is there something that we actually see not much change uh, I can jump in there and say that we're absolutely seeing that businesses um, are looking for a partner the pandemic was not nice to small businesses it's been a challenging few years and continues to be with labor shortages and wages on the rise um, after, you know, periods of perhaps being shut down or having to run uh, in a limited capacity. Um, and so we're finding that more than ever, having uh, local experts who understand what's happening in our local environment for those businesses to provide support and information, just making sure that we're offering the resources that they need and that we have that deep knowledge of our local market to really have meaningful conversations with them has become more important than ever. Awesome. Is there one thing that you guys want to say that you saw in the forecast or that you think if there's one little nugget that anybody who's in the credit union business or is a member should know about Sacramento and where it's going? I would say not anything specific. I, I definitely um, read the um, articles over the weekend, but I just think we just have a bright future in Sacramento. I just, we all rise together and that I would say there's nothing specific or incremental on, on top of the review. I think it was a, a great review put together, just really highlighted a lot of great things about Sacramento. Awesome. I think that uh, in these changing times for us, particularly in our Sacramento region, that uh, that partnership between our membership and, and our mission 
really gets highlighted. These are the times to uh, balance being not only very cutting edge and dynamic and agile, but also getting back to basics of, you know, people helping people, recognizing where challenges are and making sure that we have the, the people and the products and the services to deliver on those. I think that that's what makes Sacramento the family town that it has always been and continues to be just at an elevated level. Yeah, and I feel like the Sacramento's done an amazing job in terms of economic development around that exact idea that it's a really balanced environment. It has a bunch of different things that families can do around it and is, and is friendly to all age groups and anyone that, that wants to move there. And in fact, businesses, I think, have been attracted to that model as well beyond just people moving there as, as a place to live. Well, folks, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate your insights. And I think that people are going to learn from this a lot in terms of your own viewpoint on Sacramento and where things are going alongside of what the business review did. So thanks. Well, thank you for the opportunity to join. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.